I'm going to talk about um, arrangements for community management of water, so it's a bit of a different scale to what other people have been talking about. Um, there's a general agreement, I'm sure no one here would disagree, that adaptive management is uh, what we need and that um, this can partly be achieved by linking community management of water supply and water resources to other levels of governance. Um, for many decades now, uh, we focused on um, institution building in the water sector, and particularly building uh, water user associations, water point committees, um, and the like. And in fact, in my first watery job in Zimbabwe in the 1980s, my job was uh, to help establish a community-based uh, system of maintenance for hand pumps. So it's been going on for some decades. Um, we tend to set up these water point committees, water user associations, and we like them to be regularized, we like them to be registered, um, to have defined roles, um, to be transparent in their operation, um, to have bank accounts and so on. Uh, and we think they should be nested into other layers of governance. This model continues to, to be mentioned in policies and to be the focus of many policies, and it, it appears now as well in the sustainable development goals. But the actual evidence for the success of water point committees and water user associations is patchy. Um, I use the term patchy as a kind of polite way of saying, actually, there isn't much evidence for the success of water user associations in the way that we expect it although that does vary from uh, country to country. Um, and what you see in a lot of the literature, both the sort of practice-related literature and the academic literature, is a focus on, um, okay, these water user associations don't work as they should do, but the answer is more community management, uh, better adjustments to technology, and... Um, uh, more capacity building, linking the uh, community organization to the district level or whatever. So the, su the suggestions for dealing with this are very much within this model that we can make these institutions work better uh, by doing more and doing it better. And I argue that this is missing the point and it's not understanding how um, institutions work, how they're formed, how people make arrangements for managing their water supply. Uh, so my suggestion is that institutions for managing uh, water in this case are formed through bricolage. Um, for the purposes of this presentation, I have to simplify, oversimplify. So, of course, I direct you to read my book if you want, uh, if you want the elaboration of these ideas. Um, but the idea of bricolage is that rather than um, make decisions and make arrangements through committee structures or water point committees that are um, introduced from outside, people rather piece together arrangements uh, from the different mechanisms that are available to them, social mechanisms of kinship or authority or traditional leadership. They might borrow some mechanism from um, a previous project or from a bureaucratic arrangement, it's true. And um, they tend to mix up these arrangements and improvise with these arrangements, um, piece together uh, a sort of array of different mechanisms that work approximately in the circumstances they face and can be changed uh, as they go along. Um, such arrangements, um, people only tend to make such arrangements when they're needed. So, from a planning point of view, we're often looking for water point committees uh, that meet regularly and have minutes. Um, I've done a number of evaluations for development agencies where they're requiring us to look at these indicators of whether the water point committee is functioning. But you find in practice that whatever arrangement it is, whether it's a committee or some other grouping, only meets when they need to, when there's a problem with the water supply or when the water's becoming short. Um, so it's quite intermittent arrangements. And um, one key interesting thing about processes of bricolage is that any old arrangement, any old piecing together randomly of things won't do. 
people need to uh, feel that these arrangements have legitimacy, that they socially fit, they fit with people's worldviews, they fit with people's idea of the right way of doing things, of social order, and so on. I argue that the promise of such process, of uh, institutions formed through such processes, is that they are adaptive, they're made uh, in practice, um, and they're adapting to, to local conditions. They're resilient in the sense that they draw on existing mechanisms, existing social arrangements, and so on. Um, and they're sort of practical hybrids. They're arrangements that work in particular times and places. That's the promise uh, that's offered by bricolage. Uh, what I want to do now is just very briefly uh, show you some photos which are from research in, in Zimbabwe I did that illustrate some of the dimensions of this and also pick out some of the pitfalls or some of the uh, disadvantages. So the first thing to say, I'm, I'm drawing some pictures just from a village I know very well because I've um, done research there over a number of decades, and uh, this bit of research was done in 2010, so it was after a, you know, many years of crisis in Zimbabwe, crisis of governance and economy and so on. So there was very little support to community management, uh, and in fact communities had been left to get on with things on their own uh, for some years without any government or donors or um, development agency intervention. So I went to look at what they were doing to manage their water supplies. And the first thing I found was that um, people didn't operate through committees, um, but they were doing water management through various other social groupings. And uh, here you've got um, the ladies in their white and blue uniforms are a savings group. They're a women's savings uh, club, saving up for burials and so on. But they're also um, managing the digging out of a dam, a shallow dam. So the savings club and the dam uh, management unit are one and the same. Okay, so they're sort of doubling up. Um, people borrow money to pay their water fees in families and in uh, beer drinking groups. You can see the men there, that's their beer drinking club, and they often borrow small amounts of money to pay their water fees. And... Um, the, the women in their white uh, long uniforms are the elders of the church and they um, play a role in helping to organize people for community labor on the water system and um, keeping social order and ensuring that people follow the rules. So one of my arguments is that when we're looking at water point, we're looking at the evaluating water point committees and water user associations, we're looking in the wrong place. That the functions that they might perform are happening elsewhere. Very briefly, I'll just run through these. What you find is uh, people do indeed um, make up constitutions. I don't know if you can actually read that. It actually says constitution in English at the top of this on a sheet, an exercise book, um, because people have remembered that um, when they've had NGOs in the past, the NGOs love constitutions. And if they're asked to show something, they can show their constitution. And then they've written out some rules in Debele, which are about um, who should you, who's allowed to use the water point, no children under 10 years old, and a, a tariff system of fees, who should pay what. But the interesting thing about this is uh, not that the rules, which are uh, only approximately followed, but the fact that they felt the need to go and legitimise this arrangement by getting it stamped. And they're not sure at this point who's got authority because there's not much governance going on. So they've gone and got it stamped by the chief, the traditional chief in Kalakata, because he's got a stamp. They've got it uh, stamped by their ward councillor, um, even though the district council isn't sitting. But anyway, they might as well do that. And um, for the next village, they also went and got their stamped by the Zimbabwe Republic Police. So anyone who's got official stamp. So they're seeking a stamp of authority for these made-up arrangements. I just very quickly want to show you uh, uh, how um, these kind of ad hoc arrangements worked at one water point. This is a borehole. Um, when one day we, I noticed a notice on the borehole that says, to parents, we're asking for borehole money. I no longer go around people's homes. Each person should bring theirs. I'm serious. I'm serious. It's me, mother of Sikulu Lukili. Okay. Now, this is actually what, if we had our development sort of planning lens on, we might call the treasurer of the Waterpoint Committee is putting this notice up. 
but she's operating not in an official role, but as a, as a member of the community. She's appealing to the other uh, parents in the community that she hasn't got time to go uh, round from house to house collecting money for the maintenance fund. So they're all to come here. And she signs herself with a social form of address. And I think it's very important here that people's arrangements are socially embedded and those um, social relationships really count in what people are able to do uh, and what they're not able to do. Okay. There she is the next day, uh, standing at the water point, uh, waiting for people to bring their money from the maintenance fund. And uh, she's literally standing there, you can just see in the corner from 6 o'clock in the morning or whatever, so people who come to collect water have got to bring their money. No regularised collecting of money. This is a one-off, ad hoc collection of money done the most efficient way that they can do by standing there and collecting it. Okay? Then there's some adaptation about the actual collecting of the fees because many people don't actually have cash. This is 2010 and Zimbabwe is just transferred to um, uh, foreign currency, to the Zimbabwe dollar. Um, but you'll notice there in the list, people are being allowed to pay their fees in Zimbabwe dollars, South African rand, which is small change, or maize, so they can pay in kind. So you'll see there, some people have listed two kilograms of maize they can pay. So they're adapting their arrangements to fit people's circumstances. However, um, these um, arrangements and the payment of the tariff is subject to a lot of negotiation, but it's not negotiation in a meeting or a public assembly. It's there at the water point, and they're actually discussing who should be exempt from paying these fees and whether people who are receiving food relief, maize, should have to use that to pay their water fee. In discussing this at the water point, they're discussing many other, th they're bringing in other arguments. The nature of citizenship, we're all Zimbabweans here. Um, the nature of common experience, we've all suffered equally through the last three years. None of you are better than others, therefore we all have to pay the same. It's a human right, they're saying, and it's an international policy that poor people should be exempt, others are saying. So um, these debates about, these rules, say, about just paying the water tariff aren't just literally about paying the water. They're also, draw, they're also debated in the context of much wider meanings. Uh, I think we sometimes forget that. Okay, so just to finish this little story, the money collected in this exercise was um, only collected from about 25% of the households who owed it. And my review of other um, reports that we have of fee collection systems show that 25% success in fee collection is about standard. Um, so you might ask, is that a success or a failure? In this case, they thought that was enough, 25% of the households paid, to uh, pay for the immediate repair to the pump that they needed. So they collected the money, um, they employed a pump technician to come and do it. The money, which we are quite obsessed with, the transparency of managing funds and banking them and keeping records, is being counted out there by uh, the treasurer and, and secretary sitting on the ground uh, in front of the traditional headman of the village and his brother, who are the two senior people in the village. So they're doing their accounting uh, in a socially acceptable way, and the women are also showing due respect to the men by staying low. Okay. What I think this raises questions about is, I think communities do do uh, management for themselves, but they don't do it through the channels that we necessarily expect. And it raises questions about, in development planning, can we build on um, what communities are able to do in a flexible and ad hoc way? I've just uh, very briefly listed there um, some of the promises on the left-hand side and some of the pitfalls of um, uh, arrangements, that are, of processes of, of bricolage, um, and you can read those for yourselves. Um, so the promises are things like these processes are adaptive, but the uh, pitfalls, certainly from the development planning point of view, is that they're unpredictable or not regularised. Um, 
Uh, and there's a number of ways we can balance this. Um, the bricolage arrangements work through social relations. That's good. They mean they socially fit and they're embedded, but they also reproduce uh, power structures and so on. Uh, so I'd like to finish by saying um, the question that arises and that I'm always asked is, oh, this is all very interesting and you're showing this complexity and uh, adaptability and small-scale innovation and adaptation, uh, but what does it mean, actually, if we're an uh, NGO um, wanting a model of working with communities or community management? And um, one question that arises is, should institution... Uh, building be abandoned. Um, I do some work with uh, WWF in Tanzania, and they've actually come to the conclusion that um, building uh, water user associations, which they've supported for a number of years, is just supporting better off farmers to get more water. Um, so they've started uh, instead to put some money into uh, process approaches to stakeholder um, dialogues and so on, bringing together um, unusual kind of groupings of stakeholders. Can bricolage be facilitated in positive ways? Can we identify the strengths of um, these processes of bricolage, what people do for themselves, and kind of build on those while leaving aside some of the less desirable elements uh, like the inequalities uh, and so on? And how can we tell when these processes are happening, when um, management processes are taking place through bricolage, whether this is business as usual, whether this is just um, the big people getting, getting the water effectively uh, and leaving the others out, or whether there's different processes happening there, but they're hidden under um, the veneer of um, tradition or social acceptability or informality. So if you've got any answers to that, please let me know. Thank you very much. <laughs>